Thursday, February 10th, and it was 8.30 and we were ready to go. But uh, as, as many committees have gone this year, uh, we're going to be a few minutes late as the technology uh, continues to spin as we uh, continue to let some of the individuals in the room on the Zoom call. And we continue to have echoes. So uh, bear with us as we get going. But uh, first things first, uh, if you would all join me in uh, saying this, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, we'll get started. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you, and again, welcome uh, to uh, the 2022 inaugural session of the uh, Veterans and Military Affairs uh, Committee in the, in the Minnesota Senate. Um, first of all, let's start off. Uh, I think what I normally like to do at the beginning of the year is do a little bit of introduction uh, from each member. Tell us where we're at. Tell, from, tell us where you're from, excuse me. And uh, we'll go from there. So I, th I think uh, Mr. Vice Chair would probably be first on the list. Um, if you could Nope, just your microphone. I'm Senator Bruce Anderson, represent Senate District 19 and uh, 29, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, that's most of Wright County and a little bit of Hennepin County. And this is my 10th year in the Senate. And then uh, Senator Newton. Yes, good morning. I'm Senator Jerry Newton. Um, this is my sixth year in the Senate, and uh, I represent Coon Rapids, Blaine, Spring Lake Park. Thank you, Senator Newton. I, I, I'm going to say it because both of these gentlemen didn't say it themselves, but they both have some substantial military experience. Um, and I'd, I'd like them to mention that as well, but if they don't, I will. Yeah. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, M Mr. Chair. Uh, I represent District 13A. Uh, my district basically wraps, or actually, I District third, Senate District 13. I spent six years in the House. It's tough to break <laughs> those habits. So uh, my district wraps around St. Cloud. Uh, pleasure to be here again. And I, I served uh, uh, 38 years in the military. So it's been a, it's, uh, veterans is a passion of my life. So I greatly appreciate being here. Thank you. Senator Herr. Oh, yes, uh, this is Senator Herr. I represent District 57, which is East Side of St. Paul. Um, yeah, and one thing I want to note uh, recently, Jesse Higgins, uh, Diggins just won uh, uh, the Olympic medal uh, in China, and she used Battle Creek area of my district as her practicing ground and also inspiring uh, young here these days. So thank you, an honor to be here in the veteran and, um, and military affairs committee. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everybody. Senator Zach Duckworth from District 58, which is Lakeville, Farmington, and much of Southern Dakota County. Uh, I currently serve in the Minnesota Army National Guard. I'm an infantry officer, been serving for 17 years. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Echo. No, nope, there you go. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Chuck Wigger from Lakewood, Senate District 43. I have seven communities in the Southeast Suburban Land Use in Washington County. Uh, those communities are all strong supporters of veterans and organizations that do so much good work. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and a little bit about myself, uh, Senator Andrew Lang, Senate District 17, Southwest Minnesota. Uh, this is my second term. Uh, I've been in here about five years. This will be a six, sixth session already. 
Um, I have uh, 20 years in the Minnesota Army National Guard, uh, currently serving with Charlie Company 2 11th of Med out of St. Cloud. Um, and look, looking forward to a productive year here in the uh, Veterans uh, Committee here in the Senate. So uh, we have a, a not a lengthy uh, agenda, but we do have some uh, some presentations uh, from both the Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Mil Veterans Affairs and the Legislative Dis Director from the, the same department. Uh, the couple of uh, presentations that they're going to give are both the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs presentation on the Veterans Suicide Prevention Program that we funded last year and how that's going and how it's going to be implemented. Uh, and then the next thing on the agenda is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Bell's Veterans Home uh, Staffing Report as well as the, the health care fund. So, um, gentlemen, I don't, I don't know who would like to proceed first, but uh, I think I saw both of you on the Zoom call here. So I can start first, Mr. Chair. This is Commissioner Larry Herkey, Commissioner of the Department of Veterans Affairs for Minnesota. And good morning to all the committee members. Well, good morning, and Commissioner, and uh, proceed with your uh, presentation. Appreciate this opportunity to provide updates in two different areas here. And I think Ben uh, Johnson will bring up the slides for me. Um, just a little bit about myself, uh, served 30 years in the uh, active Army, Army National Guard. Got a chance to spend time uh, in a couple different branches, air defense, infantry, armor, field artillery, and even served a little bit of time with the Aviation Brigade in Minnesota. Retired in 2016. And with that, I got the slides up. Uh, again, the two areas we're going to talk about today are the suicide prevention program, which is new for our agency. And the second area will be the Veterans Health Care Reserve, our roll forward fund, and an update on state veterans home staffing. With that, we can go to the next slide. And you get a bonus at the beginning. We'll give you just a quick primer on the agency at a glance. I think there's one or so slides. Next slide. Just a reminder of the agency profile. Our mission again is to serve the veterans, their dependents and survivors. And we do that by connecting them with the federal and state care and benefits that they've earned. I think it's a great mission statement. It's easy to say, but uh, a little more challenging to do. Uh, but I think we're, uh, we're, we're doing a, a, a good job at uh, making sure we connect with as many veterans as we can. Uh, our number of veterans continues to whoop, go down. We're uh, currently at 304,000. See, we jumped the slides there. 304,000 um, within the state of Minnesota. We're uh, at this point losing uh, a lot of our World War II vets, as you know, our Korean War vets, and we're starting to see uh, some significant losses in our Vietnam vets uh, going forward. Program areas I won't go through. I think you understand uh, that we have four, uh, two different divisions and we're responsible for the homes and of course the cemeteries throughout the state of Minnesota along with the outreach done in over 55 communities in Minnesota. Next slide. Um, today, Mr. Chair, I'll be asking uh, permission for uh, some help with my presentation. Uh, so you'll see the first presentation will be myself and Paula Nowinski, the quality uh, director for MDVA. The second presentation will be primarily Doug Hughes, the deputy commissioner for healthcare, followed by John Powers. And then of course, Ben Johnson is there anytime we need them to step in. Next slide. Problems getting into suicide prevention in the program. We've been working on tracking numbers since 2019. I've had a program in place since late uh, once uh, funding was uh, made available uh, in, in uh, 2020, uh, 2020, we actually started with uh, sort of uh, using staff we had on hand, but 2021 in earnest. And uh, our problem statement is the reduction of veteran suicide by 20% by 2025. And then we like to figure out how we can ultimately end veteran suicide by 2035. Um, as we know, the national strategy for uh, suicide prevention from the VA indicates that suicide is preventable. We strongly believe that, and that's along the lines of the Minnesota Department of Health's plan as it relates to suicide prevention also. 
Next slide. Uh, two areas I think uh, I know that, um, that some of the members have seen this before. These are just my review and, and uh, discussion as it relates to uh, where I think we need to go as a program. And I guess there are two guiding principles. One, I think we need to provide the veterans with a sense of purpose. If we do this, they have, uh, they have a reason to get up in the morning. They have a reason to be and to exist. Um, I think this is a critical component of, of our, uh, our overall plan that we'll be developing. The second is I think veterans must feel connected to other people. Um, you know, it, it is great when veterans are integrated in their, in their society that they have a feeling that connectedness with other veterans is, is wonderful, but other people in their communities is also appropriate. And uh, if we can do, I think we have to do these two things in combination in order to be successful. We're seeing, um, I think as I've briefed before, we're seeing a lot more of our older veterans uh, in a situation where they become at risk and uh, um, these items uh, uh, fit for that group of people. And also the other group, of course, that we, we've been watching are the younger veterans that are probably just starting out uh, in life and so forth. They, they lose one of these two elements and then things go the, the wrong way as it relates to their lives. If we can go to the next slide. I uh, just wanted to provide an update. I think uh, since I brief last, uh, or we had uh, information from 2018, but now we have information from the Department of Health from 2019, 2020. The good news on this slide, as you can see uh, down uh, at the bottom, is that uh, the number of suicides overall in the state of Minnesota has went down by a, over 100, which is good. good. Uh, we had a little bit of a peak there in 2019. Um, but the, uh, probably the, the bad news is that the Minnesota veteran deaths remain fairly consistent through the last three years. The last, uh, the, I had to put that last column in that shows you the percentage of uh, veteran suicides as it relates to the overall amount. Um, you can see that uh, that also is not uh, trending in the right direction. We continue to be in double digits, which is concerning since the number of veterans in Minnesota is about 6% of the population. I have another slide. We go to the next one. It further explains a little bit about where we're going. I think the key here is to indicate from 2014 through 2020, um, again, in the state of Minnesota, uh, it's a great thing that uh, we're starting to see a downward trend. Um, the green bar shows the amount uh, actually reported by the Minnesota Department of Health for the number of veterans. What we've uh, found out through an, what's called an Operation Deep Dive, which is done by Dr. Carl Hammer, University of Alabama, indicated that uh, Minnesota, he, he took all the deaths in Minnesota and examined them. We're under uh, reporting the number of veterans deaths. Uh, many uh, individuals, our families did not report that their loved one was a veteran. Um, so. We believe the underreporting is by about 20% based on the deep dive that was done using the information from 2014 through 2019. And uh, we're gonna get uh, better at this. We'll make sure we work with the appropriate individuals uh, to ensure that reporting gets accurate going forward. Um, but uh, we just wanted the committee to know that the actual deaths in Minnesota, veteran deaths are projected, we believe at uh, about 120 for 2020. Next slide. Some good news here is again, as it relates to suicide, uh, the blue line shows uh, suicides going down in, in the last year, 2020 for the state of Minnesota. The thing I wanted to bring to the committee is that uh, alcohol and drug overdoses uh, continue to rise. In fact, they're rising uh, alarmingly uh, over the last few years. So this will be an area that we'll be looking at as it relates to also the veteran population and what we can do uh, to, sh to uh, reduce the number of deaths in, the, in that area too. But I want, just wanted the committee to be understand that uh, uh, where we are in the state of Minnesota overall, we cannot get this data specifically for veterans. I've asked for it, but it's not available from 
Minnesota Department of Health. Next slide. And with this, I hand it over to uh, Paula Nowinski, Mr. Chair, if you'd recognize her, and she'll take the rest of the veteran su suicide prevention brief. Uh, very well. Ms. Nowinski, if you could identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Lang. My name is Paula Nowinski. I'm a registered nurse uh, with the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. I am the quality director and suicide prevention falls uh, a team under myself uh, for MDVA. I am, uh, like I said, a registered nurse. Um, I have 23 years of experience over at the Minneapolis VA and three years with MDVA. I appreciate the time today with the committee. So we've been working on suicide prevention efforts for a little bit over two years uh, in MDVA. And that uh, kind of aligns also with uh, how long we've been working on COVID. And so um, we're very happy um, that we have received funding and grateful for that um, from from the Senate and the House uh, and the legislative group. Um, and then we also recognize that we've been able to do a lot of collaboration with other community partners um, at a time when um, it's been very challenging in healthcare. Uh, by state statute, the Minnesota Department of Health actually uh, owns and is responsible for suicide prevention in the state of Minnesota. So we have been partnering and walking arm in arm with the Minnesota Department of Health. We have a seat on the Suicide Prevention Task Force, developing the state suicide prevention plan. We've also been working with other state agencies uh, through the governor's challenge, and we've continued to have those relationships. Those partnerships have been essential in um, uh, amplifying each other's messages and really partnering uh, with the focus for us being veterans. So we work very collaboratively with Department of Human Services, um, higher education, agriculture in the state as some examples. We work very collaboratively with the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs, all four campuses that have jurisdiction in our state. So we work closely with Minis the Minneapolis VA, St. Cloud, Fargo, and Sioux Falls VAs. We've been partnering a lot with um, local hospitals and other healthcare agencies in the state of Minnesota, looking at how we can help identify veterans that are on their campuses and help steer them to VA services um, that are a little bit more specialized for veterans. We also are working with many community partners um, that are in the nonprofit um, arena to really be focusing on veterans um, activities and really uh, hone in on that connectedness uh, to the community level. Next slide. So what have we been able to accomplish thus far in just over two years? Well, we've been, um, thanks to funding, now been able to hire two full-time positions. One started at the end of September and the other just started at the end of December. So we have a suicide prevention coordinator and a suicide prevention liaison both with um, experience in the arena of suicide prevention, one coming from a contract with the National Guard where she was the suicide prevention coordinator and the suicide prevention liaison um, is from the Minnesota Department of Health and was working with um, uh, data collection for the Minnesota Department of Health. So they both bring in very good connections to efforts that are already happening in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we've partnered with Psych Armor and are offering free training sessions. Uh, we've been advertising that uh, to community partners and they've been very, very well received. There's a QR code on the handout uh, that we've provided also for the session. If you're interested, you can access those and take a look at those. Those are very specific trainings uh, for veterans. Uh, we're embarking on some um, death reviews um, of our veterans in the state of Minnesota that have died by suicide. Um, after um, we move forward with this, Minnesota will have the largest number of certified psychological autopsy investigators in the United States. And we will be the first state that is embarking on doing the psychological reviews uh, for all of our veterans that die by suicide and hoping to have some very, very good information by the end of the year so we can have some more specific approaches to suicide prevention um, in specific areas in our state. We've partnered with all of those other community partners and we've been successfully able to give out over 15,000 gun locks. This is um, a very important um, aspect 
in the fact that um, do we think all 15,000 gun locks are being used to actually secure guns? Uh, not necessarily, but what we do believe is that it's opened up conversations, it's given people access to information, and it's destigmatizing the need to secure guns uh, and, and other lethal means of suicide in the state. We've been partnering with NAMI Minnesota, um, and we have been offering CALM training, which is counseling on access to lethal means safety, to 52 community partners. Uh, these are providers in the community that um, serve veterans but are not specifically associated with any veterans uh, or VA. So this is a very good training to get those uh, community providers uh, having a, an awareness and understanding of you know, gun safety uh, and lethal means safety for our, our veterans. We've been able to partner with uh, Link Vet and Deed um, and our own MDVA staff on mental health first aid training. We have our own staff member that is certified as an instructor. So uh, giving eight hours of training uh, for anybody that is a stakeholder for veterans out in the community has been very good. We sponsored a very successful uh, day in October of the Minnesota Veterans Suicide Prevention and Awareness Day up in St. Cloud. That um, showing has had over 724 social media views. Uh, uh, Mayor Dave Kleiss shared a very personal story of uh, his brother who is a veteran dying by suicide and Mayor Kleiss himself is also a veteran. So um, very well received and um, a powerful message. We will be hosting this again um, some, uh, somewhere in Minnesota, the date, uh, the date and location uh, to be determined, uh, at, uh, but it's usually the first Saturday in October. In July of 2022, uh, we'll be rolling out 988, uh, which is the mental health emergency line similar to 911. Uh, MDVA is a major partner with the Minnesota Department of Health for that, and we'll be seeing lots of advertising coming up here soon. Uh, we're also working with um, a local uh, contractor for marketing, and we'll be starting some TV and radio commercials uh, on, on um, regular TV, public TV air and uh, focusing on gun safety, lethal means safety, and also just really helping advertise our link vet uh, number so that we can really be working that upstream approach and connecting veterans to their services. Next slide. So it's just some numbers um, in a graphic form from what we kind of talked about on that previous slide. Um, again, these are people that have been trained in mental health first aid. So an eight hour uh, training on how to identify, recognize and intervene um, if, if someone is having some sort of issue or concern. Um, we will continue to sponsor this class monthly and then offer it to any stakeholders uh, for our veterans. Next slide. This slide represents the amount of calls to the veteran crisis line. The veteran crisis line is um, operated by the VA and anybody that calls the 1-800-273-8255 and presses one gets access to a counselor that is specifically trained in suicide prevention and veterans um, mental health concerns. So we wanted to show you this number just because it represents the different areas in the state and you can look at where you're specifically your area code is um, for your uh, geographic area and see the number of calls. Um, the green represents um, emergency dispatches for that area. These callers are all then put into the VA healthcare system and we're ensured that they have some follow-up to all of these emergency dispatches and that these veterans are then linked with services through the VA. Our uh, link vet system thus far has not had um, the ability to always pull the same type of data and information. Uh, they're expanding that. And later this month, we will start working with them on any of their emergency dispatches and ensuring that we have the same type of follow-up that the VA uh, provides and that we're uh, helping our veterans get access to ongoing care and follow-up so that nobody is ever then lost through the cracks. Go ahead and next slide. So again, we thank you for funding um, MDVA and suicide prevention uh, program. Uh, we've um, been able to have a successful budget and, and really start um, moving things forward. We're happy to have that. But we also wanted to highlight that there are other funds that are supporting uh, the upstream approach 
for suicide prevention. And those are uh, coming through our support our troop grants. Um, there are many different organizations that are receiving those funds that are working on some very upstream approaches and again, connecting veterans um, to their communities and to benefits. And then um, also you know, the Veterans Resilience Project uh, has been funded for um, some further uh, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy and training uh, for providers. So really um, it's a effective approach for dealing and with and treating PTSD in our veterans. Next slide. So what's coming up uh, within MPDA and our suicide prevention efforts? Um, and so we wanted to just um, formally let you guys know that um, we are having monthly mental health first aid classes for stakeholders. Uh, we'll be linking up more with LinkVet and providing that follow-up on any crisis line calls that they have, making sure that there is um, some follow-up with those individuals that are calling in through that source. Uh, again, further advertisements and commercials should be coming on air, the, the airwaves and radio and TV uh, coming up very soon. We are doing and starting those suicide death reviews of our veterans um, in collaboration with a contracted uh, suicide prevention expert and the Department of Health. Uh, we'll be re-engaging all of the people that um, and agencies that were working with us in the Governor's Challenge, kind of pulling everybody back in and really looking um, at how can we amplify each other's messages, how can we unify them further and really move forward as a state. May brings us Mental Health Awareness Month, so you'll be seeing increased uh, marketing and advertising uh, for that and classes and, and things to, that anybody can do uh, for mental health awareness. In July, that 988 rollout happens. In September, it's our National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Um, and then in October, we celebrate Minnesota Veteran Suicide Awareness and Prevention Day. Um, I believe that is the, it is the first Saturday, and I think that's actually October 1st of 2022 location to be determined. We have already had a couple offers and invites, um, and we just have to finalize those details. Uh, in November, uh, we're hoping to actually um, expand and replicate what something is called the Hero Care Program that Regions Hospital does. It's essentially having social workers specially changed, trained, excuse me, in veteran specific benefits and how to access them. And um, we have many local metro hospitals that are interested in this and Centra Care up kind of in the 94 corridor by St. Cloud that they would all really like to start this type of program and really assist veterans. So we're hoping to um, um, get access to some funds through grants um, or just through their individual payroll of those uh, healthcare systems to be able to emulate that, um, that pilot program. And then in December, um, we're hoping to have a report uh, with all of the, the results of our uh, veteran death reviews. Next slide. So um, potential program enhancements as we continue to expand and roll out our suicide prevention program. I uh, just referenced the Hero uh, Care Program replication. Any um, other funding that would come in, we would specifically like to pilot that further. Again, that's putting social workers specifically trained in veterans benefits um, into um, hospitals and really trying to help them get access to their, their veteran earned benefits. Um, we'll further do some uh, more marketing and public health campaign campaigns. And then um, there are some options out there for some safe storage of firearms. And um, Wisconsin, Utah, Colorado, other states have been successful in doing this. Uh, we do know that uh, lethal means safety and, and firearm storage is essential uh, to reducing the numbers of death by suicide. Most of our veterans are dying um, by suicide with the use of a firearm. So um, some options for safe storage that might need some funding um, assistance uh, in partnership with either local um, gun shops or um, uh, fire uh, gun clubs kind of areas. Uh, any um, other questions uh, we're happy to field at this time. Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Kaminsky and Commissioner. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, 
I believe, Commissioner, you indicated that the number of veterans in Minnesota is about 6% of the population. Uh, and that the suicide rate is 13%. Does that mean we're, we're just about double uh, the number of suicides in the, within the veteran community? And um, second down, uh, uh, Mr. Messier, you talked about the gun locks, which, which is good. Is there any way to measure uh, veterans who um, are killing themselves through alcohol and our drugs and it's not being reported as suicide, but, but the intent uh, is, is suicide? And then um, I, I have another question. You know, every time I go to the doctor, they, they want to know if I'm safe, if my wife is beating me and so forth. Um, and we all experience this, but I, I wonder, you know, if, if we have people who, who indicate that they don't feel safe or that they are depressed, if um, we could have the doctors report and find out if they're a veteran, first of all, and then report that to the Department of Health or MD, uh, VA, uh, so that we get on the preventive end of it, if it, if it is at all possible. I, I don't know with with HIPAA and all that, what the rules would be. But if we could pass this information on in advance, I think it would be helpful. Um, and then what specifically is the department doing uh, in terms of outreach to individual veterans? I, my understanding is a lot of the, um, the cases of suicide are people that feel isolated. Is, is there a program to try to reach veterans who uh, have indicated that they feel isolated? And I'll leave it with that. I'll, I'll let you choose who, who wants to answer those questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nowinski or actually uh, Mr. Commissioner, either or. Uh, I'll take, Mr. Chair, I'll take the first one. I think uh, you, Senator Newton, uh, you're, you're probably right on there with the uh, with the percentages. It's probably more than double. Uh, the average for um, for the society as a whole, and that's why it's so concerning. And I think that's why it, re it requires our our attention and, and a significant amount of attention for both the agency and and I think for uh, all of our partners that are working with us. So that that is an important uh, important part of it. I think I will uh, will probably yield, uh, Mr. Chair, the rest of them to. Uh, uh, Paul Nowinski for answers for the rest. Smith Nowinski. Okay, thank you. Um, lots of questions there with um, some complexity, and I'll do my best uh, to answer and respond to those. Um, as far as the statistics, with almost double um, that of our population in Minnesota, um, that is correct. Um, it's between one and a half to two times uh, generally of what the population is. Nationally, we partner and pair um, and reflect what is also happening um, nationwide. So in that regards, um, every state is having the same issue and problem uh, as Minnesota. As far as um, medical providers being able to identify people that are struggling and if they are a veteran, um, that is part of our um, approach to trying to really have social workers that are specifically trained in veteran benefits um, and veteran health care um, in the general um, health care systems and settings. Um, to data collect on if it's one specific person that is demonstrating, um, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, that is um, sensitive medical information and protected, but there can be aggregate information that is collected um, with how many people within a healthcare system report those types of symptoms. Um, and that is something that the Department of Health uh, works on and we don't have that specifically related to veteran data unless it would be coming out of the, the VA healthcare system. And uh, lastly, uh, the question in regards to what specifically are we doing for individuals in the communities that might be feeling isolated. Um, 
right now um, we're a team of three uh, and it's been a team of one specifically in MDVA uh, for, for this bit. And our role has truly been in working with our community partners, local coalitions, smaller groups um, to truly help amplify the message and reach those individuals within those communities. And so um, our work starting next week actually with LinkVet to track those veterans that have um, identified that they're in crisis or their families have called that they're in crisis will be our first um, real one-on-one -on -one approach from MDVA uh, from the suicide prevention team. I will say that though we collaborate extensively with our CVSOs, um, our, um, our partners over in programs and services to really be connecting with the individuals on a local level. And um, we're always looking for ways to expand that and, um, and really grow uh, how, that, how we are connecting with individuals. Um, suicide prevention is generally very much a public health campaign. Um, and so we're approaching the 304 plus uh, uh, thousand veterans in the state. And so um, really digging down and finding those onesies and twosies in a, a smaller area is where we have to rely on our community partners and um, individual members in those local communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Anderson, I think you had a, no? Okay. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I got two questions here. Uh, it seemed like on slide nine, you had indicated that that you couldn't get the numbers of veterans from from the Department of Health from that. And I guess my question there would be, what can we do to incentivize or, or to get Department of Health to track those veterans numbers? And then I've got a, another question on slide 19. Uh, how many of those uh, consults are, are we tracking the success ratio there or is, is uh, you know, when we make those contacts, uh, when they reach out and we make those contacts, what's our success ratio there and how, and if that's not being very successful or however successful that is, can we take that success and, and uh, take it elsewhere? I mean, what are we doing with that data to, uh, to improve our success ratio. Uh, Ms. Nowinski or, or Commissioner Erke, either way. Go ahead, Paula. It's okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, um, very, very good questions. Um, the information on slide 19 is actually data from the VA healthcare systems. And so those uh, crisis line calls are responded to within the VA. Um, and so we are actually taking that system and trying to replicate that within LinkVet and doing our own follow-up for this, the calls that are coming in through our state specifically. Um, there are some, there are successes in there and working on data mining it down even further with the type of call, what type of service um, was issued, was that veteran eligible for VA care, were they referred out to other um, um, services outside of the VA. So working on um, data mining that down a little bit, but we have to rely on that from coming from the VA healthcare system on a federal level. As far as the state being able to break down further uh, the drug and alcohol um, deaths um, specifically to veterans, um, when we have been asking for that, it has been in the midst of a pandemic. And so um, it, at that point, they did not have the epidemiology um, manpower to be able to break those down further for us. Um, as we go forward and partner in the forensic death reviews and psychological reviews of the veterans that die by suicide, I think that partnership um, and trust level between the two will expand. And I think that we'll start to see more trends in the drug and alcohol um, data that we're finding within our veterans that have died by suicide, and it could stimulate and uh, open up the avenues for further conversations uh, with that data mining. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewinsky. Uh, members, any additional questions? Senator Weger. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner or Ms. Nowinski, is there data 
regarding the time from the discharge of the of the veteran uh, for the D214 and when the suicide occurred. Uh, within the first year, five years, 10 years, you mentioned aging vets too as a concern, but I'm curious as to how many psychological concerns may have been red flagged in the D214 or subsequently uh, through calls. So if you could respond to you know, the information that we may have already that has identified a, a potential problem. Thank you. Ms. Swinsky. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. That is one of our goals and objectives in doing the psychological autopsies and reviews that we'll be doing. Um, and that is why in the state of Minnesota, we will end up with the most psychological autopsy certified individuals in the nation is because we are going to be asking those questions and doing these reviews uh, for our veterans um, that have died by suicide. So right now that information is not readily available to us within MDVA. The federal VA uh, and the National Guard do some forensic reviews and psychological autopsies of those that have died. Um, but again, that is protected medical information. And at this time, we are we do not have access to it. Um, and we'll um, pursue those results further as we um, dive into each <coughs> review that we, that we do. Senator Weger, follow yep. up? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you mentioned through Operation Deep Dive, I assume you're partnering with that federal effort out of the University of Alabama. Uh, I assume that that's continuing. And then a question, is there any recommendations you have regarding the underreporting of 20% or so of veteran suicides uh, where family members haven't come forward? Thank you. Ms. Nowinski. Sure. Uh, Operation Deep Dive through the University of Alabama was um, a time-limited study, um, and the results were published, uh, and that took essentially Minnesota and Florida death statistics, and it reviewed our um, uh, death certificates uh, and social security numbers versus enrollment with and cross-compared with the Department of Defense. So there were errors in families that reported that there was a veteran, uh, that their family member did serve in the military and they weren't. And then there were some that didn't identify that they were veterans and they actually had. Um, and so at this time, that study is not ongoing. However, when we dive further into the psychological autopsies and death reviews that we're doing, um, if we're finding any further trends, one of our first reach outs will be back to Dr. Hamner through the University of Alabama to see if there's any other um, things that we could find and be looking for and any other trends within that if it was a certain era um, of, of um, veterans that aren't claiming status um, or that would be. And I'm sorry, I lo uh, I've lost track of that other question. Senator, we well, uh, you know, Senator Lee, I know we have an additional testimony, but I, I was just curious if there's had been some follow up with families uh, with the under reporting of 20 percent and, you know, the study had, you know, documented that and, you know, why wouldn't a family do that? I could speculate, but uh, what's being done then to address that to assure uh, better data in the future? Ms. Stowinski, I don't know if you had an answer to that or if it was. Yeah, yeah I was just saying. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I thank you for the question and the comment. I think a year from now, we'll have a little bit more um, traction under our belt, more information. Um, uh, we're starting with the year 2019 um, psychological death reviews, and those are extensive interviews with family and friends uh, and people that were close to the veteran that died by suicide. Um, about 120 to 130 questions that we'll be asking uh, each person that's been identified um, and some conversations with local law enforcement, with the medical examiner. 
So these are very extensive reviews. Um, each one will then be followed up with the report that's given to the family and survivors um, of that veteran that died by suicide. It's a nice um, report as it gives some closure sometimes to families. So um, I think that if you if we were to talk next year about this, we'll have some more themes, some more information, and be able to have some more targeted approaches to that. And um, at this time, the 20% under reporting um, is not data and information that we have um, readily available uh, to us to do any follow up on something that we can um, be approaching um, moving forward. Um, it, it's hard to go back that many years um, and, and do anything about that information at this time. Um, and I don't know what yield we would necessarily get out of that. So at this time, we'll be starting in 2019, those death reviews, then moving to deaths in 2020. And we wanted to start at that point simply because of the trend that Commissioner Herkey mentioned of actual suicide numbers going down, but drug and alcohol deaths going up. And so we wanted to kind of get some pre-pandemic interviews done and then some uh, in 2020 with the pandemic and then we'll move forward. Um, ideally, these reviews are done um, very close to the death uh, within the first three to six months. Um, but we do feel that we need some data pre-pandemic and with that um, kind of key point of 2019 to 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Anderson, I think. One last question here. Thank you. Uh, this maybe is for Commissioner Herkey. I remember of a meeting with Commissioner Herkey and the governor back, uh, I think it was the end of 2019, uh, on a blue ribbon uh, type of a panel looking at this situation. And I wonder how much, uh, Commissioner, does the governor adhere to the statistics that you show on, on the uh, slide number nine regarding to alcohol because of the fact that during the pandemic, he kept the alcohol liquor stores wide open. And yet we see this for, I'm guessing, not only for veterans, but it's for everybody in society. And I see through the pandemic that the way veterans sedated themselves was with alcohol and probably with drugs. So I'm just wondering if the governor is actually listening to your statistics that you put out. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Um, I, I don't get an opportunity a lot of times to get involved with uh, those operations that are outside the Veterans Affairs. Uh, I know he is concerned about the numbers and that we've been in contact with the governor's office as it relates to these same statistics. Uh, we think it's critical that we do get the information from the Minnesota Department of Health. And I think you heard um, uh, Paula Nowinski indicate that we believe we are going to get that information and we can we can turn those numbers around also, which we know are probably significant for veterans. So uh, our, our job is really to focus in on, on the areas as it relates to veterans, the sort of the greater policy, I, I, I probably should uh, in that situation don't ha cannot, cannot comment, uh, but I can tell you the governor is aware and he is concerned about the numbers as it relates to the increase in alcohol and, and uh, drug overdoses for the society as a whole. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could just add one item there. I think the psychological autopsies will have a significant help and I'll put it in military terms since all the members have served in the military. I wanna know what branch of service they served in. I wanna know where they served. I wanna know how long they served. Uh, I think uh, Senator Weger talked about how long it's been since discharge, that's important. Uh, I think we can actually find trends if I can get that information through these autopsies going backwards. And I know in all cases, it may not be complete, but uh, it's our intent to try to figure out as the best as we can, um, you know, what is going on in those individual lives. So I think this is a critical part of what we're, what we're trying to do going forward. And I applaud uh, Paula actually for bringing this to my attention and we're going to get a lot of people trained. We're going to do a lot of work really fast here to try to figure out about what's been going on with our veterans in the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and uh, uh, to both the presenters, actually. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me as we uh, 
as the presentation went on, the things that I was writing down as, as the members of the committee uh, were asking questions. I think we've covered every single one of my questions. I was writing down things like focus points. Uh, where can we concentrate our efforts? Are they just returning from deployments? Are they leading into deployments? Is it a year after refrad? Is it, what is it, marital status, marital issues? Uh, you know, what are, what are the age groups we're talking about here? And those are all items that if the department is having issues getting that information, I think that this committee could probably be of some assistance. Um, if it is a HIPAA issue, of course, we would be willing to, to address that um, and, and take that on. Uh, but we need that communication from the uh, department. So if there is an effort or uh, a need, let's say, that uh, the department needs from the committee, uh, please let us know. But uh, again, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think next on the list we have the, the Department of Veterans Affairs presentation on Veteran Health Care Reserve Fund and the state's Veteran Home Staffing Report. So, uh, Commissioner, you're still up. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lang. Thank you for providing so much info, uh, time for the committee or for us to present today. I think Ben is going to bring up the slides again, but while he's doing that, I'd just like to preface this in saying that the last two years have probably been the most challenging two years in healthcare for budgeting that this uh, agency has ever had. The number of uh, additional expenses that were unexpected, mostly through testing, but some through you know purchase of additional pharmaceuticals and so forth to be, be able to give treatment uh, uh, and so forth to our, our residents, but a significant amount of testing that was done. And then the other large challenge really is the area of lost revenues due to census uh, having to be adjusted and, and uh, Commissioner Hughes will get into that. But I, I just want to tell you that I do get briefings on this uh, routinely. Almost once a week, I, I get updates and we've been on top of this. And uh, as soon as we can get the medical green light, uh, my intent is to try to get as many uh, uh, veterans into our homes as we can. It's been a challenge for for several reasons during COVID to be able to keep our census at the high level that we normally have maintained in the past. So with that, if we can go to the next slide, and I think I will hand it over to Deputy Hughes for his uh, review of uh, the healthcare division staffing and also as it relates to the carry forward funds. Mr. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning. Uh, Douglas Hughes here, uh, Deputy Commissioner Healthcare, uh, active Army retiree, um, pharmaceutical, uh, Latin America for about 10 years, so some pretty good business experience, federal VA, a home and community-based services manager at Minneapolis, and I've been in my role as the Deputy Commissioner for Healthcare since uh, July of 2016. As you can see in the slide before you, I don't think it's anything that uh, no one has seen before. You've probably been at some or many of those, if not all locations. So those are very familiar to everyone. I just want to point out, you know, that uh, we do still have the adult day healthcare program, which we'll talk a little bit about that. And if I forget, um, at the leading age conference yesterday in downtown St. Paul, they won yet another uh, quality award uh, that we're very proud of. Next slide. So what we're gonna talk about today are these um, five bullets, the uh, historical amounts and the current of the reserve, the, the uh, current historical uh, bed capacity, and Commissioner alluded to that, so we'll, we'll be getting to that. Uh, state and national standards, as far as staffing, you'll see that our staffing, except for a few minutes in one uh, veteran's home, is above state and federal uh, levels. Metrics and surveys pertaining to quality of care, you'll see, we'll see, you'll see we're well above. And the um, uh, staffing levels and uh, vacancy rates, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that, which is really no different um, than uh, healthcare anywhere in the state of Minnesota or the country. So the uh, Minnesota Veterans Home Special Revenue Account, uh, we prefer to call them carry forward, you know, are used for operations and to uh, mitigate against unexpected costs. And um, really um, what we've used those, uh, those carry forward funds 
um, were very instrumental in, in uh, uh, helping us uh, continue um, forward without any hiccups in what we need to do to complete our mission. Uh, but in addition, we also have the general fund, as you know, the VA, uh, federal VA, where we uh, receive uh, per diem for our veterans resident maintenance fees, which of course is based on uh, means, uh, is means based, and then uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid CMS, which we've made inroads, uh, especially in our pharmaceutical area. Um, we don't like to announce it, but we do have a pharmacy that provides all the medications uh, for our veterans about 99.9%. And we actually um, had a surplus this year of about 760,000 uh, that was um, added uh, as a result. So we're very proud of that. Next slide. So here is the, the reserves. And as you can see, um, we've been very steady um, since coming in. Uh, the senior uh, healthcare staff. Uh, and myself and all the administrators and directors of nursing in those uh, areas have done a great job in uh, maximizing um, our budget. And so we've been very consistent in the area of our reserve. And as a, just as a matter of, uh, of um, reference, you know, our budget, this is uh, uh, um, less than I believe 30 days uh, are that 13 million or four, near 14 million. That's about 30 some days. I can't remember the exact calculation uh, if we were to not be funded, but um, that's just as a point of reference. And as you can see in uh, 2022, uh, we've used uh, some of those funds uh, for um, our, our testing mainly and uh, other PPE and other infection prevention methods. Um, we're hoping to get some uh, additional funds, but as of right now, we have not received any additional um, whatever source FEMA cares uh, for uh, the fight against COVID, uh, but we're, we are planning to apply for every and any uh, nickel that's available to us. Uh, we are already preparing our numbers and preparing to submit uh, for that. And so we will be uh, well placed when the gate opens up and hope to be uh, one of the very first in line to request those uh, potential additional funds. Next slide. Okay, um, here's our bed capacity right here. And um, as you can see um, in our numbers, um, uh, we've, we've been doing a getting our numbers up compared to um, previous years. Uh, but then of course, when COVID hit, um, I can't remember if I've, I've briefed on this before, but um, you know, we had to have set aside areas uh, in our facilities. Uh, for example, if you're familiar with um, the Minneapolis campus, uh, we set aside uh, 22-4 as our COVID unit. Uh, so uh, residents were um, with COVID uh, were, were isolated in that area as a protection uh, for themselves and additionally for staff uh, because um, all uh, infection prevention measures were um, taken to protect uh, both uh, the resident and the staff. Uh, but we had to keep a lot of those open beds. Um, if you were to come in, in at, at, depending on uh, when it was during the pandemic, uh, you had to be in quarantine for somewhere around 14 days, regardless of your um, uh, status. Um, so we had uh, two separate areas for that in uh, building 22. And the same was similar in the other skilled areas. Um, but as you can, uh, was already mentioned by um, Commissioner Herkey, um, we are, we're ready to ramp up, um, but we'll get to some of the challenges that we have. And as you can see, Silver Bay down there, before I forget to mention, uh, you know that we're doing an extensive HVAC uh, program up there or um, a build up there, which is causing some of the re re reduction in uh, beds up there. Uh, but as soon as uh, that project gets done, we'll be looking uh, to bring that back up. Next slide. 
So um, we have this uh, CMS uh, has objective measures uh, that we report. And um, so it's a strong indicator of in evaluating a nursing home performance. And what we've done is um, as a requirement is we've done uh, payroll based journaling and we report that uh, to CMS, it's a requirement and it gives us our numbers. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, really allows us to do that in a, in a very accurate way is the um, scheduling and timekeeping system that we implemented um, in the past few years that is um, a more automated software system that allows us to track that better. Um, and we're very proud of our staffing numbers. Next. So the healthcare division, as I mentioned, I'm a little bit ahead, but we, we brought that in there and it really helped us understand. I think we still have some, uh, some tweaks to do on that. And uh, we've done such a good job that the developer has asked some of our staff to come and be um, subject matter expert, experts on that. So they'll be going out, I believe, to California to provide uh, our input uh, into that. And the healthcare division is also working uh, with another consultant to make sure that besides the software that we're very accurate on what we do because uh, A, um, it's, it tells us what we're doing as far as staffing, it tells uh, residents and family, uh, it tells uh, you, uh, stakeholders in the legislature and anyone who has any interest in how we are staffing. Next. So the, uh, all four uh, skilled homes are CMS certified. Um, so we, all of those measures are in there. Um, we get looked at, uh, we get surveyed by the Minnesota Department of Health on a regular basis. I can't tell you the number of surveys that we've had uh, in the past uh, two years, mainly re related to uh, infection prevention and some other areas, but we've been, we've been surveyed so many times. Uh, you know, it's just, it's like, uh, when I get the alert that uh, the survey team is in uh, Minneapolis or Silver Bay, it's like, okay, uh, we're before it kind of used to be a big deal, but it really isn't anymore. Um, they, but they do, they pull objective data and then we wanna be, as I mentioned, as transparent as we possibly can. And there's other measures and other facilities that we are measured against. So we'll take a look at those. Next slide, please. So here's the four skilled facilities. And as you can see, uh, first column, uh, the second column I should say is the, is, the, is the veterans home numbers, second Minnesota average, and third is the federal average. And I believe there's one is perhaps um, uh, the Minnesota average in RNs is uh, a few minutes more for the state average, but well above the federal average. But as you can see, we're well above uh, in most uh, areas above Minnesota and federal averages. Um, we're very proud of that. Um, um, we believe that we provide uh, the highest uh, quality of care uh, in our homes. And um, if you haven't heard uh, Newsweek and another agency uh, in the past, I believe five weeks ago, perhaps six, named the Minneapolis Veterans Home one of the top uh, performing nursing homes in the country. I believe we're number eight in the state that came out in that. Um, and it had to do with quality. And another thing that we're very proud of is our response to COVID. Um, unfortunately, there were some veterans homes in the country that, and I, I, I don't know the circumstances, so I'm not gonna be critical of them, but who did not fare well. Uh, we fared well. And we're very grateful for that. And a lot of the reasons uh, is because of the funding that we receive and the great staff that we have. Next. So here's some of the direct care uh, uh, standards or, or, uh, for the DOMS. I know that a lot of you have interest in the, in the DOMS. We have our, our, our residents in Hastings, about 100 and 12, 115 down there on average, and about 35 in Minneapolis. They're not required to provide CMS data, but um, we do have that for our own uh, our own use. And uh, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with other domiciliary programs in the area or in the in the country, 
but um, we are quite different. Uh, we had a visit uh, by the uh, secretary of the VA who toured uh, the Hastings VA, and he um, uh, was uh, absolutely impressed by the program that we have uh, for the domiciliary program. We named it the Minnesota model, and uh, we're very proud of that because we take veterans um, who may have um, some uh, issues with mental illness, um, drug and alcohol abuse, dual diagnosis uh, that we're able to help and provide um, the, the highest quality of life that those veterans are able to uh, achieve. Next, next slide. So here's uh, once again, um, our quality measures. So uh, we're, going, we're gaining, um, um, if you look down at dining services, that's still a little dip, but we do have, or we have had a contract uh, that has been in place for about a year, maybe two with US Foods. I think that was a great change from uh, Indian Head Food Service. And so we're inching up in that area. Uh, we'd like to do better and um, what we've also done is we've hired a registered dietitian to assist us uh, across all of the veterans' homes and the and the three new ones that are coming. She's a very experienced, uh, advanced degree registered dietitian, and she's already hard at work. So we'll be working on getting those measures up uh, in dietary and quality of food as well. Next. So um, as I mentioned, um, we get surveyed uh, by the Minnesota Department of Health. And uh, what uh, we have, uh, we, we do get what we call tags now and then, um, uh, which, we, um, which we correct. Um, we re recently received uh, some tags for the domiciliary down in, in, uh, in Hastings. Um, and we received a letter from Pat Kelly over at the Minneapolis VA who does that oversight, the, the real uh, high level oversight of us for our domiciliary program and all, actually all of our homes. And we received the uh, go ahead letter that we, that we met everything. And what is not up to date on this is the Silver Bay uh, uh, survey, the uh, state survey that was done in the last, uh, I think, believe in January. And we still are shaking our heads uh, in, not in disbelief, but in just awe of, uh, they had zero uh, tags or zero findings up in Silver Bay. And we have a fairly new administrator up there, a very seasoned DON and we're very proud of that. And um, uh, actually of all our homes, we do a great job in quality. Next. Uh, staffing, um, uh, and unless you are, not reading a newspaper or watching the news or you don't see anything, you know that um, that staffing uh, is the problem in, uh, in many areas, uh, health care and long-term care in particular. Uh, we're certainly no difference, uh, different. Um, in Minneapolis, um, because of staffing, we had to uh, dip down uh, to from a, a total census in the skilled facility of 300 down to 270. We're trying to build that back up. Uh, we've had some hires. Um, so our goal actually is to go back uh, to 300. If we were to go back to that slide, you'll see that we, we came pretty doggone close to having an average of that uh, just prior to COVID. Um, and uh, as mentioned previously, our goal will be to get those up as, uh, as soon as we can, because we know that if we don't have a full house. We have veterans in the state that we're not uh, serving, uh, but we can only do so much with what we've had, what, what we have. When staff members have COVID or they have a high risk exposure, they're out of work, and that really dictates um, how uh, and when we can have um, admissions. Uh, we, we partner with just about everyone that we can. Uh, I know that the commissioner and senior director Simone Hogan are part of the thousand uh, CNA program uh, that uh, was initiated by the governor's office. We have uh, clinical sites at our locations. Uh, we're doing everything that we can. Uh, and the last bullet, um, we are we are developing. We just received some uh, great uh, new hires into our HR uh, department. Uh, that we're really going to have an aggressive 
uh, recruitment and retention strategy. We're working on incentive bonuses. We're working on uh, staff members who've been there for a long time who don't have any more steps to provide them uh, perhaps with some sort of uh, monetary uh, incentive to stay. There's just a lot of different things that we're trying. Uh, uh, RN um, uh, reimbursement for their education. We're trying everything, anything that's available and everything that's available to us, we're trying because we know that we're gonna be competing with everyone else in the state. I believe that might be the last slide. So um, ready to take any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hughes. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Hughes? Senator Weger. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Uh, congratulations on the awards that where you've been recognized. I know a great deal of work has gone into this. I'll point out too that Senator Box Committee, uh, the bonding committee, which I'm a member of, uh, last month we were at the Minneapolis VA and we were. Uh, very impressed with you know the you know the amount of pride that's going into uh, it for continual improvement and uh, I think you'll see some reflection you know in ultimately what we'll recommend hopefully and also in the training programs for healthcare workers and uh, we got to look at uh, you know, a number of the efforts that are being done for recruitment training right there at the facility so job well done thank you. Thank you, Senator Weger. Um, it looks like we have a couple of additional testifiers and we're kind of running a little short on time. We have 13 minutes left of committee hearing. So Mrs. Nowinski or uh, Mr. Powers either uh, wishes to continue on. Mr. Chair, this is, uh, I see Ben Johnson's got his hand up, but uh, I think uh, uh, Doug Hughes, uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, took all the items as it related okay. to the health care. So I think we're through that. Uh, if Ben's got something else to add, then uh, I would ask you to recognize him. Mr. Johnson. Right. There he is. Chair Lang, uh, thank you. Uh, no, I was just going to um, let the committee know that those, those two were uh, subject matter experts to supply additional comments as needed. Members, any additional questions? Uh, Senator Newton's got his hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, for, for Mr. Hughes, I, I have a question uh, relating to admission to the domiciliary program. I, I know to get into a veteran's home, you have to be recommended by a doctor that uh, that's the level of care that's needed. Um, what are the qualifications to get into the domiciliary? Is that is that outlined in statute or in uh, rules of some sort? Um, I don't know that's particularly outlined in uh, Administrative Rule 9050, which really governs us. Uh, but um, we do have uh, criteria uh, prior to admission in the domiciliary. Um, Really, the only uh, barrier to that is um, you really need to be somewhat independent uh, because we, we're not a skilled facility. It's licensed as board and care. Uh, so, so that is somewhat of a requirement. Um, and we, we really need the veterans to be uh, chemical free. Uh, we have a lot of veterans in both Minneapolis and um, uh, Hastings who are struggling with chemical dependency. And to have active users there uh, just uh, is, 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 is not good for the program. Uh, we really are, we, we actively look for um, uh, residents in both of our facilities. We work with the homeless program. Uh, Mike Anderson, who is the administrator of the program in both sites, uh, works hand in hand with that. Um, he was very, he gave a presentation yesterday at Leading Age in the River Center and um, he was very proud that we, we took uh, several veterans off the homeless registry and, and placed them in the domiciliary. Um, that's, that's our goal. We'll, you know, um, there's a difference between skilled there's a, and, and, and domiciliary. And one of our main goals is to see how many uh, we can possibly take off the homeless registry. So those are the two requirements and that's our goal. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Hughes. I, you know, I would appreciate it if, if uh, you or, or Mr. Johnson could send the information to me as to uh, admission requirements for the domiciliaries. Thank you. Uh, members, any additional questions? Well, see, seeing none, I would just like to uh, say that I appreciate uh, both the uh, presentations that we've had today. Um, that the topics we covered, I think, uh, constitute a, a bulk of the work that uh, the committee has done over the last couple of years. Uh, a, a commitment of not only financial means, but uh, definitely, you know, the human capital that we've, uh, both by the committee, but definitely by the department on both ends. Um, when it came to the uh, the new vets homes, uh, the continued uh, funding and uh, well, really support that we can give to the vets homes we have. And then of course, uh, the suicide uh, prevention program that uh, obviously you could tell that we were all quite interested in and, and very supportive of. I think that uh, that's why the Senate Veterans Committee is here uh, to try and help you along the way. And, and again, I appreciate any uh, you know, needs that the department has when it comes to information gathering. So uh, members with that, uh, we've reached the end of our agenda. Um, next uh, meeting next Thursday at 8.30 a.m. And I will, I'll do something as uh, I forgot to do today and embarrass the staff a little bit by having them introduce themselves. So we'll do that next Thursday. But uh, with that, uh, the Senate uh, Veterans Committee uh, will be adjourned. Thank you.